Good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the Heidelberg Joint Astronomical Colloquium. Uh, this week, we're pleased to welcome a local speaker, Matthias Sormani of the Institute for Theoretische Astrophysik of the University of Heidelberg. As you know, um, Matthias is recognized worldwide as a leading expert in the computational simulation of physical processes determining the distribution and dynamics of gas and stars in the central regions of the Milky Way, which is also the topic of today's colloquium. Um, Mattia obtained his DPhil, which is the PhD equivalent, in astrophysics at the University of Oxford in 2015, with thesis on the topic uh, large-scale dynamics of the interstellar medium in barred galaxies, under the supervision of John Magorian and James Binney. In 2016, he came to Heidelberg as a postdoc in the star formation theory group of Ralph Cresson and Simon Glover. And he's been based there ever since. And um, during this time, there was a remarkable development because Mattia built up an extensive network of independent collaborations worldwide, um, but also extending to other institutes here in Heidelberg. And I think it's also worthy of mentioning that although Mattia is devoted to theoretical and computational investigations, he's not really shied away at all from participating and helping to shape many of the major large scale observational programs surveying the central regions of our galaxy. And there's no doubt that um, one of the most challenging and potentially walking tasks, bearing in mind the typical nature of the Milky Way is to actually try to bring together ab initio simulations to interpret these uh, increasingly detailed observational studies. And so to hear all about this, let me, without any further ado, pass the floor to Mattia for his colloquium entitled Gas Dynamics, Inflow and Star Formation in the innermost three kiloparsec of the Milky Way. Take it away, Mattia. Thank you very much, Richard, for this uh, nice introduction. <clears throat> okay. So yes, today I would like to give you an introduction to the gas dynamics and star formation in the central regions of the Milky Way. So this is my outline. <clears throat> in the first part, I will introduce the longitude velocity plots, which is the main theoretical tool uh, that we use to interpret the gas flows. In the second part, I discuss the gas dynamics in uh, non axisymmetric bar potentials. And then in the third part, I put the two together and I discuss the applications and what we can do with this. So let's start with the first part. <clears throat> this is the usual drawing of the Milky Way. The sun is down here. And uh, what we want to understand is what goes on in, in this region. And you can see in this drawing uh, the bar <clears throat> here as a very uh, non axisymmetric feature. The difficulty, the challenge is that uh, we live inside, so it's not easy to uh, unravel what the galaxy would look like if we could fly above it. And the gas uh, helps a lot because, in addition to the amount of gas in, at each position in the sky, we can also measure uh, its line of sight velocity. And uh, this gives rise to data cubes which are the intensity of radiation at each velocity from each position in the sky. And uh, our first task, task is to learn how to interpret uh, these uh, data cubes. So the main tool is this uh, longitude velocity plot. Essentially, because gas is confined to a thin layer near the galactic plane, it's convenient to average it around uh, uh, B equals zero, which is the galactic plane. So <clears throat> this removes one dimension and you are left with this LB plot. And here I show you an example of the, uh, uh, for the one for atomic hydrogen. So the galactic center is in the middle and the intensity, the grayscale gives you how much gas there is at each point uh, <clears throat> in the, along the disk. So the, as you move horizontally, you move along the disk uh, of, of the Milky Way and the, uh, vertically it's the line of sight velocity. Okay, so <clears throat> we start with the simplest possible motion, which is purely circular motion. And uh, here I put a, a top-down view. Here is the sun and I, I have a ring. And what does this ring look like in the longitude velocity plot? Well, it becomes a line. And I want to, you to notice two things. 
First, that it's a two to one function. So these two points here, P1 and two, are mapped into the same point in the LB plane. So there is a, this a twofold degeneracy. And the other thing I want you to notice is that when you look exactly to the galactic center, so L equals zero here, the velocity is zero if you have purely circular motion because the, uh, the velocity here is uh, per perfectly perpendicular to the line of sight. So when you go at L equals zero, the velocity is zero if you have circular motion. This is what happens when you put many of these uh, together. And uh, <laughs> the first application, the very old that was done with this is that you can measure the rotation curve of the Milky Way by measuring the envelope of, of these in the observations and comparing with the, with the models. Because you see that if I change slightly the rotation curve on the left, then the envelope changes and you can deproject this and go backwards. And this works as long as the assumption of circular motion is correct, which is outside the bar, the bar region. Um, so this is how far you can get with the circular models, more or less. So up here is the uh, CO data. Here is the H1 uh, data. And here is the circular model. And you see that the circular model captures the whole, the overall shape of the emission. But when you look at the details, uh, there are many things that are not explained, especially in the, in the central region, which is what I want to, to focus. And uh, <clears throat> using this ORT already in 1958, so very old, uh, reconstructed the face on view uh, map of the Milky Way. And he already recognized that something was off in the, in the central slice here. Uh, and he already, so he already saw that something was, was not okay about uh, the assumption of circular motion here. So let's have a closer look at this central region. Uh, the clearest indication that there are no circular motions is any emission within these two boxes. So this stuff here and this stuff here. This emission is impossible. So it's, it's called forbidden velocities, but this is just for, means forbidden to purely circular motion. So anything on circular motion cannot, be, cannot produce any emission here. Then you have these features like the three kiloparsec arm, which cross L equals zero at the velocity minus 53 kilometers per second. And this is also impossible if the three kiloparsec arm is on a circular orbit because then it will need to cross at zero velocity. You have all these uh, other features, the connecting arm. You have these very high velocity peaks, which are line of sight velocity of 270 kilometers per second, which is higher than the velocity of the sun. So these are also a little bit puzzling. And the question is what causes all these features? And in the early days, until this review from Oort in 1977, the main hypothesis was expanding motion. So some explosion in the galactic center and the gas is not only circulating, but also expanding. But then in the 90s, it became established that the Milky Way is a barred galaxy. And today we interpret most of these features uh, as caused by strong non-circular motion due to the galactic path. So this is just to show you how non-axisymmetric is the, the galactic bar. This is the reconstruction of the Milky Way uh, bar stellar density from red clump uh, star counts. And you see it's pretty big and pretty non-axisymmetric. Non okay, so now what we need to do is to understand the effects of non-circular motions on the LB plots. And let's start with slightly non-circular motions and then let's move to strong non-circular motion. So this is, a circular orbit, and this is the trace in the LB plane. So let's now make this a slightly non-circular. You see that here is imperceptib imperceptibly non-circular, and here it opens up uh, noticeably. And when you put many of these slightly non-circular orbits together, nested together, with the major axis that changes with radius, what you get in the LB plane is this. So although here the spiral arms are relatively weak, in the LB plane they become very strong. So when you look at the data and you look at the LB plot, you are actually looking at the spiral arms of the Milky Way directly, just not in the space where you would like to see them so <laughs> from the top down view, but you are looking at the spiral arms of the Milky Way. Okay, so this was slightly non-circular motion, but what about the strong non-circular motion driven by the bar? So the key to understand that is to understand the closed orbits which brings me to the second part of this talk, which is the introduction to gas dynamics in bar potentials. So 
let's take the simplest possible barred potential, which is the sum of a, an axisymmetric part, phi zero, plus epsilon, small number, times a quadrupole, so a cos two theta. So this is the simplest possible model of a bar you can have. Uh, so this is just what I, I took for these functions. And uh, from now onwards, everything we do is in the rotating frame of, of the bar. So first, let's start with the bar turned off. So no bar, completely axisymmetric. And let's look at the orbits. And we play a game called the uh, uh, surfaces of section. So on the left here, I show the, the orbit from the top down view. And on the right, every time on the orbit, I cross the uh, y axis from left to right, I write down the point of the crossing, so the y coordinate of the crossing, and the y dot velocity of the crossing. So for example, for a circular orbit, I always hit the same point because it's boom, boom, boom. I cross at the same position, and I always get the same point here, boom, 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 is one point. Now let's give this orbit a little kick. What happens? Well, you get epicycles around the orbit. But in this plane, you see that the points circulate around the closed orbit. Can you find other closed orbits in an axisymmetric potential? Well, yes, you can. For example, you can find this orbit here, which gives you this point. But when you give this a little kick, the orbit is unstable. So the, uh, the, the, the particle doesn't remain close to the initial orbit, but it circulates. And when you look at this in the surfaces of section, it circulates also around the closed orbit. And when you do this for all the possible orbits, what you find is essentially that every orbit in an axisymmetric, every planar orbit, let's say in the plane, in an axisymmetric potential can be understood as an excursion around the circular orbits. Then you can repeat the game with the small part. So now you take epsilon 0 0.1, you get an orbit which is slightly non-circular and you get a point, okay? Then you give this a little kick, very similar as before, fine. Then you find also another closed orbit, which is very similar to the closed orbit as before, but now comes the key difference, which is when you give this one little kick, now it's stable. So the fact that the potential is bar has stabilized the orbit. If you go around the orbit, it stays closed. And when you do this for all the possible orbits, you find that the phase space divides in regions and like this region is said to be parented by this closed orbit here, and this other region is parented by this closed orbit here. So the key takeaway is that when the potential is non axisymmetric there can be more than one family of stable closed orbits. And here you see how the phase space changes when you increase the strength of the bar. So this is axisymmetric, and then you see that as they make it more and more axisymmetric, the uh, elongated bar uh, grows and it's more and more phase space. Okay. So in a bar potential, the two most important families of closed orbits are x1 orbits, which are in blue here, and, they're, and they are elongated in the direction parallel to the bar, and the x2 orbits, which are these black orbits here, which are uh, mildly elongated in the direction perpendicular to the bar. And when you run a simulation of gas flow in a bar poten in this exactly same bar potential which I draw the orbit, uh, what you find is that the gas follows x1 orbits out here very well, follows x2 orbit in this region here very well, but then there is a transition region in which there are no non-self-intersecting closed orbits available, and in this transition region uh, the gas transits from one type of orbit to the other, along these two features here called, the, that are essentially large scale uh, bar shock and are um, the theoretical counterpart of these uh, barred dust lanes that you often see in, in barred uh, external galaxies. Okay, so here is just to show you how, so in the left, I have the density uh, field of the, sorry, the velocity field in the simulation. Here I have the velocity field of the orbit, and here I have one minus the other, so the difference. And you see that out here and inside here, the difference is very small. And in this region here and here, the difference is large. So this is the transition region where the orbits don't approximate. Okay, 
And this is the, uh, what happens if you add the bells and whistles, let's say, to these simple simulations. Uh, so here we have a live chemical network that can keep track of the various components of the ISM. So you have the total gas, the atomic hydrogen, the molecular hydrogen, and we also have star formation and supernova feedback. And you see that, yes, the gas on small scales becomes more complex, but the framework of X1 orbits out here and X2 orbits uh, down here and the transition region, that remains valid. So uh, that's the, uh, the basic tool to understand even more complex, uh, the basic framework to understand even more complex uh, simulations. Okay, so now that we, I, I, I've given you this very uh, brief uh, to the false. Um, uh, Mattia, can I ask you a question before you move or is it a good time to ask your question or? Uh, sure. Um, sorry, the, um, the slide when you show the difference between the, the orbits and the simulations. Uh, yes. Um, the, yeah, the, the color bar, is it uh, in percent, like we have fluctuations of the order of 2% or? Uh, sorry, just, just, just uh, have an... Uh, I, no, the color bar I think is in hundreds of kilometers per second, if I remember, correct. Okay, but still, the, 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 okay, but the, the, the background is 100, so it's kind of percent. <laughs> I guess in the mm, well, oh, I don't know. <laughs> okay, no, sorry. Yeah, just to do it, just, just understand the order of magnitude of the deviation. Okay, never mind. Sorry. Thanks yeah. for answering. Okay. Uh, okay. So now we can use this knowledge to interpret what we see in the LP plots. And let's start from three kilo, three four kiloparsecs from the center, and then we gradually move uh, inwards. So the bar-driven spiral arms. What is this feature here called the three kiloparsec arm, for example? Well, <clears throat> when you run, you run a, a simulation like this, and then you project this to the LP plane. And what you see is uh, that the spiral arms get mapped into these kind of features here. Uh, this I'm showing with my, one of my simulations, but this is a very old result. I think the first uh, very impressive for the time simulation showing this is this uh, Mulder and Lin. Uh, 86. And yeah, so the modern interpretation is that the triculoparsec arm is one of these uh, spiral arms extending out of the bar. High velocity peaks. So what are these uh, very high velocity peaks that you see in the observations? Well, again, you take the data, you take, a, you take a model and you see the same feature. And then you ask, okay, where is this feature coming from in the model? Well, it's coming from the fact that you the sun is down here and you're looking at the bar almost, the line of sight is almost aligned with the bar. So the gas here, which is going on these very elongated X1 orbits, has a, a velocity which is almost parallel to the line of sight and is going very fast because it, it, it's close to the pericenter of this orbit. So when you, when you see this gas in the LV plane, you get this very high velocity peak. And Notice that this is despite the rotation curve being uh, steadily rising from the center. So there is no peak in the rotation curve. And this is uh, a misconception that is sometimes found in the literature that uh, sometimes people say, ah, I have a peak in the LB plot. I can explain it by putting a peak in the rotation curve. But this is wrong. It's just an artifact of assuming circular motions where the motions are, are not really circular. So if you look at the velocity curve like this, that's, that's not real. In reality, it should be something like this. <laughs> so you can leave these rotation curves outside the three, four kiloparsec, but when the mo mo motions are non-circular, you, you should not believe this. So a more plausible rotation curve is, is uh, someone, something like this, for example, in the, most, in the innermost one uh, kiloparsec. And I, I worked recently on constraining this. Forbidden velocities. So what is the material in this? red boxes. Again, you take a model, you see the same kind of feature, and you ask, where is it coming from in the model? Well, it's coming from the fact that the gas on these X1 orbits can move away from you, even if you are to the right of the galactic center, which is impossible for if you have circular motion. If you have circular motion, everything to the right must move uh, towards you, and everything to the left away from you. Uh, but <clears throat> But if you have non circular motion, that's, that, that there is no such constraint. Dust lanes is a, also a very interesting one because I will talk about it later. You can use this to constrain the inflow. 
so even in the typical drawing of the Milky Way, you can see these two features, which are called bar dust lanes. And can you see this in the data? Well, yes. Uh, turns out that there are these two features here. And again, you can discover this by looking at the model. You see kind of the same feature. And you ask, OK, where is this coming from in the model? It's coming from exactly this uh, bar dust lanes. OK. Good. Extended velocity features. This is another um, puzzling feature about these uh, LV plots. So when you look at the LV plots, you see these very prominent and very broad line features. These are extremely broad line because they, they span a velocity of more than 100 kilometers per second. Like here is two, even more than 200 sometimes kilometers per second. And what can be causing this? Because you need an enormous amount of energy to generate such broad line features. And the fact that the, the lines are two kilometers per se, two, 200 kilometers per second, that's comparable to the velocity of the sun around the se center. So that suggests that is uh, some large scale dynamical process that is uh, causing that. And we uh, published a paper in which we explain these features as uh, with this mechanism. So you have gas coming down here from one dust lane. And sometimes this gas accretes onto the ring here, the central molecular zone, but sometimes it just uh, brushes it and flies over, so pa passes over it and lands uh, on the dust lane on the opposite side. But when it does so, so the gas is coming down from here and the gas on the other dust lane is moving upward here. And so at the contact point, you have a very different uh, velocities and you have a, an extreme collision. And how this extreme collision shows up in the LB plane is, is like one of these uh, uh, vertical features. So you, you have a gas coming. So this is one of the, so the one dust lane is here, then it's overshooting the center molecular zone is, is here. And then the other dust lane is here. And here they look very, they have very different velocities, but they are actually the same physical point. So there is a transfer of material from one to the other that in the LV plot uh, shows up as this uh, red vertical feature. Yes. So this is again a diagram showing the same uh, dynamics. We have gas coming down from here and gas flowing up here, and here you have a, a collision. And I, uh, this is, uh, I think, uh, confirmed also by the fact that you can see in the data that these vertical features, they end exactly at the velocity of one of these dust lanes. And you can even see these secondary dust lanes. So here, exactly like you see in the model. So in the model, you have a primary dust lane and the parallel one here that goes at the lower velocity and the, the feature connecting the two. And here you have kind of the same. And then moving even closer to the center, you have the central molecular zone, which is, is a uh, accumulation of much denser material closer to the center. So here I'm showing it in yellow. So the gray is a CO. And the yellow is uh, ammonia in H3, which traces gas much denser than CO. And you see that the, the denser gas is much more concentrated in the center. So what is the central molecular zone? Well, uh, <clears throat> as you can see here, it's basically this uh, ring of material here in this, in this framework. And uh, if you look at the observation, the central molecular zone is lopsided. I mean, it's very asymmetric. And uh, three quarters of the gas is on, on one side and only one quarter is on, on the other side. And why is this happening? Well, if you think naively about the X1, X2 orbit picture, there is apparently no reason to expect any asymmetry in the gas distribution in the X2 region here. But when you run simulations at very high resolution, it turns out that there are some uh, hydrodynamical instabilities related to this uh, uh, bar shocks. And this causes some unsteadiness and uh, turbulence in the center. And uh, I will keep the story short. If you have more questions, you can ask me later. But in the end, it turns out that this is, this is a real. And uh, we confirmed it with a linear analysis also. And it can explain the amount of asymmetry that you see today in the same set. So this is without any stellar feedback or gas self-gravity is a purely large-scale hydrodynamic effect. 
Then if you also add uh, stellar feedback, um, the AGN, other things, then of course this can create further asymmetries. But the point here is that you can, you can, you would expect asymmetries even without uh, any star formation or any uh, any feedback. Okay, <clears throat> and this is also another interesting uh, thing. But I want to skip to <clears throat> to talk more about other things. I will just mention that when you look at the dust lanes in the sky, uh, they are not. Uh, lying exactly in the galactic plane, but they are tilted by a few degrees. And when the gas from the dust lanes accretes onto the CMZ, it does so with some uh, vertical momentum. And so this vertical momentum is imparted to the gas in the CMZ. And what we postulated is maybe this is what gives rise to these uh, vertical oscillations that you see the dense gas streams in the CMZ, like they are being hit from this large scale flow, but at the vertical end. So the final picture that I want to convey from this first part of the talk is that you have all these features in the LB plot and <clears throat> you can interpret most of them in, within the uh, coherently within the framework of gas flow in, in, in the bar potential. And <clears throat> you can use this also to constrain, for example, the bar properties, because what you do is you run many, many, uh, many models with some parameters you project the models to the LB plane and you see which models fit uh, best all the features in the LB plane. And we did this in 2015 and we found, for example, we constrained the, the pattern speed of the bar, which is arguably, arguably its most important parameter because it sets the location of the resonances. And we found a lower value that was favored at the time. And then this was also later confirmed by, by Gaia Day. So uh, gas dynamics can give you uh, good constraints on the, uh, properties of the galactic bar and the potential. Okay, so now I want to talk a little bit about the uh, inward the transport of matter from the galactic disk and down to the, to the very center. So the big question uh, is uh, how is gas transported from uh, the galactic disk, so kiloparsecs away from the center down to the uh, supermassive black hole at the very center? And it turns out that this inflow happens in a sequence of steps. So the first step is the bar driven inflow. The bar efficiently brings the gas from roughly three kiloparsecs down to the central molecular zone at 150 parsecs from the center. Uh, you can see this process uh, here uh, in this model, for example. So here I have the data, here I have the model. And you look at the model, you see the dust lanes and you see these ridges, vertical ridges here. This is the accretion taking place. So the material goes, gets transferred. So this is the dust lane. And then when the dust lane hits the central molecular zone, you get accretion, uh, which is visible through these uh, uh, vertical ridges. And uh, <clears throat> you see the same uh, in, in the data essentially. And so you can use this to uh, constrain the accretion rate onto the CMZ. This is what we did in 2019. So we isolated the, the dust lanes in the data. We have a, a bar here that um, gives the time to accretion to in the future. And uh, you imagine that this gas here will be flowing to the center and all sucked up uh, in the central molecular zone. This is a simplification, of course, because in reality, only it gets partly uh, 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 accreted onto the CMZ and partly overshoots. And so in reality, you have an efficiency factor that gives you, well, is, this is right, uh, roughly 30%, which decreases the, the result. So <clears throat> what we get is that uh, from observations, the raw result is roughly two solar mass per year. After correcting this for, overshoot, for the overshooting fraction, you get roughly one solar mass per year. Uh, and this agrees well with simulations that we, we have done here in Heidelberg and also that Lucia Armilotta has done. So it all seems uh, pretty consistent. So the number that I want you to keep in mind is this one solar mass uh, per year. And you can also derive a more detailed uh, inflow rate as a function of future time. And this is not, completely flat, but it has some bumps that are related to the fact that the gas in the dust lanes has these uh, denser clumps. So when these denser clumps will accrete into the CMZ, we will get 
a temporary boost in the accretion rate. Okay, but then, uh, so the gas with the bar can arrive to the CMZ, but then how does it go from the CMZ inwards? That's what I call the nuclear inflow. So it's from the 150 parsecs to the innermost few parsecs. And <clears throat> this is the uh, illustrated by this uh, experiment. So numerical experiment, we took two identical simulations, uh, except that the one on the left has no self gravity and no star formation. So it has a bar. Uh, and the one on the right has exactly the same external bar potential, the same treatment of the interstellar medium, but it has the gas self gravity and the gas can collapse and form stars, which can um, then uh, have feedback, uh, supernova feedback. And what you get is that the bar inflow is identical in these two simulations, is one solar mass per year. But the one without star formation, the nuclear inflow is, is exactly zero. So it is exactly zero. And you can see it that from this picture here that inside here, there is nothing, there is no gas. But when you add the supernova, this region here gets filled with gas. And when we measure it, it's much smaller than the bar inflow, roughly a factor of 30 smaller, but still it's, it's pretty significant if you look at the, <clears throat> what you need to fit the black hole and circumnuclear disk here in the most uh, few parts. So from this, what we concluded is that um, if you have supernova feedback, this can cause you a significant inflow, but uh, we still don't know how this compares with uh, some other contributions that remain to be determined because magnetic fields can also uh, drive uh, mass transport to the magnetorotational instability, for example, like they're believed to do in many other types of accretion disks. We don't know what happens if we put more stellar feedback. So not only supernova, but also stellar winds, photonization, or maybe even the feedback from the, from the AGN. And another big question is, is the potential at in the innermost few hundred parsec axisymmetric or not? Because if it's not, then there is a nuclear bar, which a priori roughly one third so 30% of external nearby barred galaxies have a nu nuclear bar. So there is one in three chances that the Milky Way also has a nuclear bar a priori. And if that is the case, then a lot of what we know about gas dynamics and star formation in the central molecular zone, it's, uh, it's wrong. We have to do it again. <laughs> and this is an open question. Okay, so the last uh, topic I want to talk about is uh, star formation. And I take a moment to advertise that uh, we have been writing a review on star formation in the central molecular zone of the Milky Way, which is uh, submitted for the Protostars and Planet 7 conference. So I hope this will appear in, on the archive in maybe one or two months uh, maximum. And uh, yeah, so this is <clears throat> the central molecular zone in uh, the three different wavelengths. And you have in uh, red, the cold gas and the dust. So this is the, the gas that I talked about in previous slides. You see the, here the infinity shape. And then you have uh, in blue and um, uh, green, the warm dust. So this is gas heated by the, uh, so it's young stars and gas heated by young uh, stars. And the, the idea is that when you look at this, uh, you are looking at the at this, so at the nuclear ring like this, but just from an edge-on view. So we, we cannot see this. So from a edge-on view is of course much more complex to, to understand what's going on. But the basic idea is that this is a, a ring-like structure like this, this just seen uh, edge-on. And uh, <clears throat> one of the main puzzling um, problems that uh, have been discussed in recent years in the, in the last 10 years about the CMZ is that, well, it's forming a lot of stars, the CMZ, because it's the most extreme star forming environment in the galaxy, but still the, it's forming less stars than people expected based on the amount of dense gas. And when I say dense gas here, uh, I don't mean molecular gas, I mean gas denser than CO. So gas denser than roughly 10 to the four uh, 
particles per centimeter cube. And you see that uh, Milky Way clouds and external disk galaxies and so on all seem to fall on this uh, relation uh, between the amount of dense gas and the star formation rate. But the, the CMZ is, is a little bit below, and there is no real um, consensus, or, or consensus on why this is the case. Um, I also want you to notice that this is not the more common schmidt kennicott relation. So if you look at the CMZ in the schmidt kennicott relation, it's more or less fine. Yes, it's a little bit low, but it's consistent within the scatter. So it's, but the, the difference is that the, the schmidt kennicott looks at the total amount of, of, uh, of gas. Well, here you only look at the dense gas that people expect to be more correlated with star formation. And indeed, this correlation is, is tighter than, than this. Another interesting point is that the total star formation of the CMZ is about 0.1 solar mass per year. And this is about 10% of the estimated info. So the question is, where does the rest go? Is it because the star formation rate in the CMZ is fluctuating? And so on average, now it's smaller than, so now it's smaller than the average? Or is it because the rest is maybe blown up by galactic outflows, such as the Fermi bubbles, the X-ray chimneys, and, and so on? That's uh, an open question. Another, in, another interesting question about star formation in the CMZ is uh, how is, uh, is it spatially distributed? Are there preferred locations for star formation? So there have been three, here I, I'm very schematic, there are three main scenarios that have been proposed. So one is the popcorn scenario. It's the star formation happens uniformly all around the room. Then there is the pairs on a string scenario, which is star formation is triggered at the, con at the, at the contact point between the star formation ring and the inflow. So you should find younger stars closer to the points and then all the stars that you move downstream. And then there is the pericenter passage scenario, which is a little bit like this one, but rotated by 90 degrees, in which the star formation is triggered at the pericenter uh, because of tidal compression, and then um, uh, yeah, downstream gets all the stars. And we tested this using simulations. So when you look at the instantaneous star formation rate, it's impossible to see any clear pattern because there are just too many fluctuations. But uh, so you see here, these are uh, the CMZ ring at different snapshots. And sometimes you have star formation here, sometimes here, sometimes here. So very hard to say. But when you average these uh, over time, so we took the simulation and we averaged it over many snapshots, then some patterns uh, begin to emerge. And uh, when we analyze these patterns, what we get is that the personal string scenario is slightly favored. So star formation happens everywhere but a little bit more is triggered at the upper center than, uh, than, than, than average. Um, and this is uh, challenging to address with observations because observations give you only a single snapshot, so not <laughs> a full sequence of snapshots to, to average. And it's, so it, with a single snapshot is impossible to tell even the, in the observation. So it's very hard to, to confirm or disprove these observations. Okay, then um, I will go over this quickly. Um, we analyzed also the trajectories of the newly born stars in our simulations. And we use this to constrain um, the origin of the arches and quintuplet clusters. So the arches and quintuplet clusters are two very young, four mega years and massive, more than 10 to the four uh, solar masses clusters for which we have a very precise astrometric uh, uh, spectroscopic uh, data. So we know the line of sight velocity and the, we know the 3D velocity. So what we did is, okay, we took uh, clusters from the simulations which have uh, line of sight velocity, age and uh, mass. Um, so we took, um, uh, yeah, clusters with the same properties um, consistent with the, within the observational uncertainty to observe one. And we trace them back in time to see what was their origin. And we found that the most likely scenario is that these clusters are born uh, near the contact points between uh, uh, the dust lanes 
So the, the accretion points where the dust is accreted into the CMZ. Of course, this is not guaranteed because there are many uh, possible clusters in our simulations that are consistent with uh, what we see in the observations. And a curiosity here is that uh, I think it's interesting. There are newly born stars on very eccentric orbit belonging to the galactic bar. And uh, this is demonstrated by this uh, Sagittarius E, which is a massive uh, H2 region complex in the galactic center. Uh, it's located here and you can see here these little uh, uh, circles. Each circle is a, an H2 region essentially. And when you look at this in the LV plot, this H2 region complex is, is extreme. So on the right here, you see in the observations, they these H2 regions have much, much uh, uh, larger in modulus line of sight velocity than any other H2 region in the galaxy. And we believe that this is because they are at the tip of this dust lane. So again, we use the simulations to, to understand where these um, are coming from. And we think that these are uh, stars that have formed from gas that was falling towards the center along the dust lane a few mega years ago. And then this gas uh, will, uh, sorry, sorry, these stars, because the stars are collision lanes, they will not stop in the ring here, but they will fly and overshoot, and then uh, they will probably become part of the galactic bar. And um, the, the last thing I want to say about star formation is uh, an interesting open question, which is what controls the temporal evolution of star formation rate in the same set? Because we have observational evidence that the star formation in the CMZ happens not in a steady way, but in a series of episodic bursts. And the question is, okay, what is driving these bursts? And there are different theories in the literature. The two main ones are, one, uh, that there are variations in the amount of fresh gas available to the uh, bar-driven inflow. So when you get uh, a lot of gas coming, then you get a burst of star formation. The other theory is that even if you had a steady inflow, the star formation would uh, um, go in a sequence of feedback cycles because you have gas accumulating until you get a lot of star formation and then the star formation is so powerful that disrupts the ring, stops the star formation. And then after a while, the gas accumulates again. And so the, the cycle repeats. And there are simulations which are almost identical that give <laughs> opposite result. And now we are trying to understand, okay, where is this difference coming from? There are some differences in, in the feedback that uh, is implemented. Uh, like our simulations have um, no early feedback, but only supernova feedback, but much higher resolution. While the Armilotta simulation have a much lower resolution, but um, they also have photoionization feedback. So we don't know which one is uh, giving the difference. Um, and finally, I will briefly mention my current work, which was on the archive um, yesterday. And uh, recently, my focus has shifted more towards the stellar dynamics, and in particular, on modeling the nuclear stellar disk. So the nuclear stellar disk is, is this. Here I'm showing uh, uh, stellar counts in the infrared, in the K-band from Nishiyama. And you see that there is a very a dense, high, highly flattened stellar structure here. And at the center, you also find the nuclear star cluster. And uh, the total mass of this nuclear disk is uh, roughly 10 to the nine solar masses. The radius is around 120 parsecs. These components dominate the gravitational potential in, in the, between 30 and 300 parsecs from the center. So this is exactly where the gas in the CMZ is, is sitting. So if you want to understand the gas flows in the CMZ, you have to model the nuclear disk because that's uh, giving you the background potential. And well, it could be a non axisymmetric secondary path uh, in feelings, but we don't know. And there have been some suggestions in the literature, but uh, they are inconclusive because they, so they, there are some asymmetries that you see, for example, in stellar counts from two mass, but these asymmetries could also originate from extinction because as I said before, there is much more gas on the left side 
And so you can see it here. You see these dark uh, spots here. These are molecular clouds that block, block your view. So uh, this gives rise to some asymmetry, but it's just a fake asymmetry just because of extinct. And um, the nuclear stellar disk is in practice the long-term product of star formation in the CMZ. So if you overlap the dense gas, yellow here, and the uh, nuclear disk, you see that they're pretty much the same size. So the idea is that over time, uh, the gas in the CMZ produces stars and over giga years, they accumulate and form the nuclear, the nuclear stellar disk. And uh, there is a paper uh, for nuclear disks in, in external galaxies by Bittner et al, which argues, I think convincingly that uh, these nuclear disks grow inside out. Because when you run a simulation of gas flow in bar potential, you find that if there is no nuclear disk, then the dust lanes, they don't accumulate the gas in the ring, but they go straight to the very center. And then they start forming a nuclear disk. And this changes the gravitational potential. And this gravitational potential makes the gas flow um, accumulate in the ring at larger and larger radius. And so essentially, you get that the disk grows inside out uh, with this mechanism. OK. And uh, so what we did in, the, in our paper is because we wanted to understand the structure and dynamics of the nuclear disk. My, my original motivation was I want to understand this gravitational potential so I can model the gas flows in the CMZ. Uh, and we constructed the uh, axisymmetric uh, self-consistent dynamical equilibrium models of the nuclear disk. So here I'm showing the, our best fitting model. These are degrees. So one degree is uh, roughly 140 parsecs. Uh, and this is the density. And we fitted these models to uh, the kinematics, so the line of sight velocities, and also the proper motions in a number of fields in the, the survey from Fritz et al. Uh, cross match to the proper motions with Pyrac 2. So here, this is the last thing I say, and then I'm, I'm finished. Um, you see for each field uh, in red, you see the line of sight uh, uh, kinematics, histograms, and the proper motions. This is parallel to the plane. It is perpendicular to the plane. And we model it as the sum of two components. So the nuclear disk and the galactic bar. The nuclear disk is, is uh, dashed and the bar is dotted. And you see that the same model can explain the data in uh, many different fields. So in total, we have five parameters which are the same for all the fields. And I, um, I'm quite pleased with the, with the results, I have to say. And um, yeah, so far we see that the data seems to be well explained with the axisymmetric model. So we don't have any obvious evidence for the nuclear disk being a non-axisymmetric or a nuclear model. Okay, so these are my take home messages. So the first is that the longitude velocity plots are a very useful tool to understand the large scale gas flows in the Milky Way, that they can be interpreted, interpreted in the context of gas flow in the bar potential. Then about the inflow, that the inflow happens in steps. So first you have, the first step is from disk to the central molecular zone, which is done by the bar. And then there is from the central molecular zone inwards, which is not done by the main bar, but by something else. And it's an open question. And then the, the galactic center is a very interesting uh, laboratory for star formation. And there are many interesting uh, open questions to entertain us for uh, many years. Thank you. Thank you very much, Matthias, for, Matthias, for this very um, insightful um, and detailed view of the dynamics. Um, I'm sure there's lots of questions on many aspects. Um, Francesco, why don't you ask your question? Yeah. Um, Walter, try to ask the question if you have, uh, sorry, to, to write or to type the question if you have one. Um, now I have a question it's about the nuclear inflow um, with and without the, the star formation. So you mentioned that, I mean, it depends on, on the, some critical feedback like supernova, supernovae and, uh, and maybe the AGN feedback and, and, and whatnot. So I wonder, is there, um, 
does it critically depend on on some assumption you do about uh, you make about uh, I don't know the, the the rate of supernovae at different times or how you model the agent feedback? Uh, is it critical critically dependent on that? And eventually, how efficient is it to bring the gas down to the inner parts? So it's actually two questions. <laughs> yes. So um, oh, it's it's a good question because what we have no, done sorry. here is I think it's a preliminary step. What we have seen is that is like, I think it's a clear illustration that the supernova feedback can give you quite a significant inflow, but we don't know how this depends. For example, if we change the gravitational potential, I think we need to redo this with uh, a more accurate potential for the nuclear piece, nuclear cluster and so on, because we, we don't have this uh, very accurate at the moment. It's more like a power law that averages this. And, um, and we have to test, uh, I, I think what, what you can get from this is supernova are very likely to be important, but I, I cannot tell you uh, how will the results change if you change a little bit the, the amount of, uh, of feedback or the feedback prescription of the potential and so on. And also how, how it does with all the other mechanisms. So I think what we should do is um, try to test all the mechanisms, but within a coherent framework, like magnetic field, uh, feedback and so on, all in a comparable way, because otherwise you get an inconclusive answer. That, that's what has been done so far. Like the, the, there are many ideas, but it's very difficult to compare. Sure. Especially if there is some interplay, then it becomes a nightmare, I guess. Uh, and what's the second part of the question? So is it efficient to bring gas into the inner few parsecs? Well, uh, yes, because you see here it's 0.3 solar mass. Well, per that year, depends so on the distance where you can actually, I mean, eject or, I mean, does it yeah, go into so the, you, does it flow into the, the black hole, for instance, or? No, no, no. So this, what, so what you should imagine this number to be is, uh, in the, uh, there is a, inside the central molecular zone, there is a, a circumnuclear disk, which has a radius of around the three parsecs. So that's. So, so you can simulate that. Kind of. Like, okay. I think oh, nice. Could That's be done nice. Again, but with a more a better potential. Oh, wow. Yeah. But, okay. but yes. So I think you should take this number as an indication of how much gas you get from the CMZ to the to the circumnuclear disk. And if you do that, it's it's a significant number because uh, the circumnuclear disk, the total mass is like ten to the four, ten to the five, maybe maximum yes. four masses. And at this rate. Uh, you build it up pretty quickly from, from, from zero. So, yeah. Thanks. Okay. Um, Ivan Cabrera Ziri, please go ahead. Yeah. Thanks, Matia. It was a great talk. Uh, I'm not in this field. I don't know much about this, but I was wondering if you can study extragalactic adjoint galaxies this way and learn something about the structure. Sure. Yes. You can study even face on galaxies. It's not a <laughs> It's not a problem. Actually, that's a very good um, topic because in FANGS, uh, they have uh, ALMA observations for a lot of nearby parallel galaxies. So it would be great to do that for, for their galaxies. But uh, uh, that requires a lot of time. <laughs> so sure, I think it's a great idea. Yeah, it's pretty cool. Thanks. OK, I think Walter's microphone is fixed now. So go ahead, Walter. OK, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, very good. Very good. Uh, very good. Very nice talk, Matthias. I enjoyed it. Um, I've let one comment and one little question. And yeah, I, I like the work on the molecular zone and and the nuclear disk. And uh, I think that's that that if you steer the gas a little bit with star formation, then clearly some gas has to go and uh, lose angular momentum, and more gas loses angular momentum if it hits other gas that has lost angular momentum. So there is a cascade of of gas with ever less angular momentum. Uh, I actually simulated that with a PhD student in a similar context. But I think, of course, if you come talk about black holes, one has to be aware that the black hole is much, much smaller than parsec scales, right? So we, um, the, the, uh, to those, because you didn't say this, I think one should say that the, uh, the accretion disk around a black hole, which works with MRI, presumably, that only is efficient in the sense that the, the, uh, the angular momentum transport scale time scale is shorter than a Hubble time on scales of um, less than milliparsecs, right? So, so we, really, we really don't really yet know 
how gas goes from the parsec scale to the milliparsec scale, which is another 10 orders of three orders of magnitude, right? You know, you, you can break perhaps from kiloparsec to parsec, which is already great, which is three orders of magnitude. We need another three, right? And um, yeah, so I, I proposed in, in this in this work, we looked at the feedback of the central thing. So this is the other thing I wanted to say that this episodic thing that, you know, this is not a, we don't see something, I think, in particular in these objects, we, we cannot trust that they stay as they are, you know, they, there will be episodes in which they're more active and less active. We do see that most galaxies seem to be not active, but some are active. So that I think is a thing because they have a time that is longer than a human lifetime, much longer, in which they're active. Um, and that may also explain, you know, that you have a higher inflow rate, star formation rate currently, and, and the gas has to go somewhere. And that, that can happen in an outflow. I think this, this is yeah. a reasonable explanation. And the outflow foot could be driven, driven by star formation, or it could be driven by, by the AGN itself. So that the, you know, that if you, if you give it a lot of gas at the time, it eventually pushes a lot of it out again, and then it starts up all again to build up for a long time. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I, I, I simplified in the sense that, yes, I, it, as I said, the inflow happens in steps. And th the first step is the bar from three kiloparsecs to 150 parsecs. And then the second step is uh, the to, from 150 to the circumnuclear disk, let's say three parsecs. But then there is further steps that I've not investigated in my work. Right, is, right. How, how does it go from three? So, the, the black hole dominates the potential in the innermost one parsec, roughly. So how does it go from the circumnuclear disk down to the sphere of influence of the black hole? And then from there, how does it get to the accretion disk of the black hole, which is, like you said, milliparsec. So these are further steps. Mm. Yeah, I, I, was, I was looking back in, back in the time in, in this last step, you know, because the sphere of influence definitely is completely axisymmetric. So the other thing I was talk was thinking about is angular momentum. The, uh, any outflow that is driven from the center by you know by um, a gas outflow by either supernova feedback or the supermassive black hole engine will simply just do not talk the gas at all. It would just push it out, and so the gas loses angular momentum as it comes in, and then when it is blown out, it doesn't really gain anything. And so it essentially the angular momentum is kept with a bar so how much angular momentum is that essentially is that, i mean how much or in other way presumably the angular momentum is the angular momentum that it has when it enters this frequent parsec arm so but has the question then is how much how much is actually over the lifetime of the bar um how much gas has flown in yeah mm. well uh... Can this be constrained I, or is this? I is think, I, I, yeah, I, I, I don't know the number from the top of my head, but I think someone has done this. Um, All right. I think what, what you should do is, if you want to do a back of the angle of calculation, is take this one solar mass per year uh, inflow and say, okay, one solar mass per year from three kiloparsec to 150 parsec, how much angular momentum is that? And that is uh, sucked by the bar. Okay. Um, Thank you very much. I think we need to move on now. Um, if there are more questions, uh, we will be extending the Zoom session. So please stick around for more questions and awful, just an informal chat if you wanted. Um, before we thank Mattia, I'd like to advertise next week's talk. So I'll just share the screen. And next week we'll be going back to the solar system, we'll be hearing from the principal investigator of the Perseverance mission on Mars, Ken Farley, who will be telling us all the latest news from the surface. And I hope lots of very interesting pictures and videos too. So uh, with that, I would like to ask everybody to open up their microphones and their videos and let's give Mattia a very warm applause for this very informative talk. Thank you, Mattia.